All right, so uh, many of you out there are parents, and I think I'm going to shift the gears a little bit here, but I know um, I'm a parent too, and I think part of feeling well um, has a lot to do with how much anxiety we have about our own children. And one of the things I hear a lot of women in this age group being particularly anxious about is all the stuff that's out there in the media that we're getting bombarded with, uh, especially in reference to puberty. So I'm going to talk briefly about puberty to hopefully equip you with some, uh, some knowledge as you maybe help your daughters go through this change. So I'm going to start by just kind of overviewing uh, normal puberty, what timing, sequence, and tempo is. I'm going to talk about what initiates puberty and some interesting new data about modulating factors with puberty. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about when to bring in your child for an evaluation, or your, she's not really a child anymore, although she'll always be your child, but um, when uh, you should seek evaluation from a physician. So um, in terms of what is puberty, puberty is defined as the period of first becoming capable of reproduction. There's a lot that's happening during this time. Many of you may remember it from eighth grade or so. Um, involves maturation of genital organs, development of secondary sex characteristics, most notably breast development. There's an acceleration in growth. The growth spurt occurs during puberty. Changes in affect. Many of you may be able to attest to this if you've had to deal with the changes in affect in your child as she navigates this. And in females, it culminates with the onset of menarche. And menarche is uh, basically the first period, the first menstrual cycle. So there's a wide range here, and one of the questions I get asked a lot is, what is normal? And really, the definition of what is normal has changed and continues to evolve. So the first sign of puberty is breast development. The average age in this country of breast development is age 10. But there's a wide range, and now we're seeing that breast development starting at age 7 or 8 in a girl can be normal, um, all the way up to being delayed until age 13. This is followed by the growth spurt. And we see the growth spurt because um, estrogen is being released. It acts directly on bone. And we generally see that peak, height, that peak height velocity or the peak spurt about six months prior to the onset of period. And finally, the onset of the first period generally occurs about two and a half years after breast development. And the average age in this country is about 12 and a half years. So what factor initiates puberty? The exact signal is not completely known. This is a very busy slide. It's one that I show our medical students. But what's so interesting about this is that this early part of the slide shows weeks of pregnancy. So what that's showing us is that I always say to my patients, the other hat I wear is fertility, infertility. But Mother Nature is cruel and unfair. And she gives women the most number of eggs they'll ever have when they're still in their mother's uterus at five months pregnancy. Okay. A female fetus has about 2 million eggs. At birth, she's already lost them, down to 1 million. At puberty, there's about 500,000 eggs. And then throughout our, our uh, reproductive lifetime, those eggs are lost. And the average age of menopause in this country is 52. And that's when you're kaput out of eggs. OK, your ovary says, I am retired. <laughs> I've done my job. So what's interesting here, though, is that actually that female fetus is born with everything there. And something happens at birth that turns it off. So this is this very quiet period of time from 2 to 10. Everything's just shut off. And something happens that releases this break. It's considered a break. And the brain is what controls all of this. And there's some signal that releases the break that then initiates puberty. So everything is controlled from the brain. And the brain is what sends down the message to the ovary to make an egg, make estrogen, and estrogen is what causes these effects on bone and um, menstruation. So it's a very elegantly regulated system. And the brain actually gets feedback from the body. I always tell the medical students the only reason women have periods evolutionarily is to reproduce. So your brain can get signals from your body saying, is this a good time to reproduce? It hears about energy stores. It hears about stress levels due to circulating hormones in your bloodstream, OK? And so different things can turn on or turn off that message from the brain. One that we're learning a lot about is something called leptin. Leptin is a hormone that's related um, and released from fat cells. So high levels of fat, high levels of leptin, 
low levels of fat, low levels of leptin, okay? So very, very low body fat, the body says, is this a good time for me to sustain another being for nine months? No, and it shuts off reproduction, okay? So uh, a girl who's very, very underweight will not turn that on, will not turn that signal on. The brain will say, it's not a good time. I need to conserve energy. I don't have enough metabolic fuel here, all right? So <clears throat> we know that leptin is important in initiating that signal. And really we're talking more and more in my field about this threshold effect that there is a critical body weight and percent fat mass that is necessary to turn on puberty. And uh, especially nowadays there's a lot of pressure um, and I'm seeing a lot of teenagers who are struggling with either maintaining their periods because their body turns this off because there's not enough fat stores or even getting them. The flip side is true as well. Uh, high levels of fat will release higher levels of leptin and that gives the body the signal that there's more reserve. And so we do see that uh, heavier or obese girls will undergo puberty sooner, okay? And that can have its own set of issues with early breast development, early onset of periods. So another reason to have your child maintain a healthy weight. So what factors influence puberty? This is just a uh, interesting graph uh, from the 1840s until the 1960s. You've seen that the age of menarche worldwide has been decreasing. So we know that actually the average age of the onset of first period has been decreasing about two to three months per decade for the last 150 years. Um, the National Health Institute actually does this huge survey and they found that uh, the average age now is 2.3 years, which is again about two months prior to 10 years prior data. And we know that part of this is due to improved standards of living, especially if you're comparing it to the 1840s. Uh, but part of it is also due to the increase in obesity that we're seeing worldwide. Other issues that uh, influence the onset of puberty include genetic variation and race and ethnicity plays a large role in this. There's environmental uh, studies looking at sort of different factors that might be influence, influencing puberty, and I keep talking about nutritional status. So genetics, we know that there's good correlation between the age of first period between mothers and daughters and between sisters, and we know that it's very normal to see racial differences in onset of puberty, um, especially African-American girls have earlier age of uh, menses than their white counterparts. This is just a uh, graph looking at breast development, and you can see that for each age group, African-American children are much more likely to have breast development compared to whites, and this is part of the uh, racial difference I'm talking about. And of course, that does also translate into an earlier age of puberty. So the first sign of puberty is breast development, and you can see that at age eight, over a third of African-Americans will have breast development compared to 10% of white Americans. And this stage is actually old. I'm going to show you something in a minute. So nutritional status is very important. We talked about obese girls have puberty at an earlier age. Girls with anorexia or delayed or extreme physical conditioning will have delayed puberty. I don't know how many of you guys saw this. Uh, the media is really interested in puberty, and this was a big story uh, in, at the end of the summer that a large study was done and found that girls in the U.S. are actually entering puberty earlier than before. So uh, I showed you the data from before, but this is girls at the age of seven who have breast development. And in 1997, so this is second grade, okay, 5% of white girls had breast development and that's up to 10% now. So one in 10 second grade girls has breast development now. Um, and uh, interestingly, there was no difference, even though it looks like it's very different for uh, black Americans, that was not statistically significant. But we are certainly seeing that compared to 1997, just a little over 10 years ago, there has been a big shift um, in terms of how many white girls are entering puberty at age seven and eight. And again, this comes with a set of issues. Earlier maturation has lower self-esteem, less favorable body image. There's um, a higher chance of eating disorders, an earlier age of first intercourse. So it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on and it's something that you should be prepared that you know you may be seeing this more. 
The question is why? I mean, that's really the big question. Why is this happening that we're seeing this earlier onset? And the answer is nobody exactly knows. Of course, anyone who goes to a grocery store right now knows you're going through the aisle. Oh my gosh, it must be hormones and food. Everything has to be organic and no antibiotics and no growth hormone, et cetera. The reality is the studies to date have not borne that out. Okay, so there's no evidence that giving your daughter the regular milk instead of the organic milk is going to make her undergo puberty sooner. The data that came about food outbreaks was from the 1970s in Puerto Rico. There was contaminated food supply with high levels of estrogen, and they had a little outbreak of breast budding in seven-year-olds, but um, since then it really hasn't borne out. So having said that, many people are buying the hormone-free food. I'm just saying there's not great evidence to back it up. Something that's gotten a lot more attention recently are these endocrine disruptors, so estrogen-like endocrine disrupting chemicals. So the most common one that you hear about is bisphenol A, BPA. So if you're going to buy the water bottles, you'll see the ones that say BPA-free. Basically, um, there were some rodent studies in mice that showed that BPA exposure may have changed some of the expression in the fetal mouse ovary. And initially, the FDA said, oh, it's nothing. And now they've really very mildly shifted their stance to say there may be some concern. And you're seeing a lot of companies are moving towards marketing BPA-free uh, products. And what is BPA? It's the thing that's in the very clear baby bottles, those clear plastics, the Nalgene bottles. Really, we know it has estrogen agonist-like effects. And we have been recommending that people move away from them, especially in baby bottles and things like that, because the jury is out. We don't know, but it is an area of active investigation. So uh, I'm going to just shift now and talk about delayed puberty. Basically, when should you bring in your daughter or tell your friends to bring in their daughter to see the doctor? What we say is pubertal delay is when it's greater than two and a half standard deviations from the mean. So that means absence of any breast development by age 13 or absent of, absence of that first period by age 15 warrants a workup. The other thing I was talking about was sort of the timing and the tempo from breast development to first period is generally about two and a half years. And if that hasn't happened, that's another reason to bring your daughter in. In terms of menstrual irregularity, menstrual irregularity is very common right after uh, onset of first periods. So, so this whole brain to ovary to uterus shedding the lining messenger system can take a while to be established. And really, we can say it can take up to five years, OK? So having those slightly irregular cycles is not at all uncommon. You can see at three years, 50% of girls, three years after their first period, will still be having that occasional skipped period. Um, generally, by five years after first period, you should be having pretty regular cycles. If your daughter skips more than, and actually, or if any of you do, because this can happen throughout the lifespan, but um, absence of six months of periods, less than eight periods a year, or cycles, you know, the first day of your menstrual to the next first day is taking longer than 45 days. Those are all reasons to seek an evaluation. When I see adolescents in my office, I almost never, ever examine them on the first visit. And I think that's something important. Um, a lot of, uh, I think, parents are sort of reluctant to bring their daughter in because they don't want her to be traumatized. The daughter's really stressed about it. So a lot of this workup can be done with just blood work and a history and height and a weight and things like that. So um, definitely don't let that deter you. All right, I'm going to talk real briefly about a clinical scenario. This is something I see in my office very frequently, and then I'll move on. So this is a 16-year-old. She came to me. She hadn't gotten a period for seven months. She'd gotten her first period at age 12 and a half, and they'd been pretty regular. Um, in terms of her social history, she was high school junior, the president of her class. She was on a travel team for field hockey. She's an excellent athlete. She was actively being recruited at her collegiate level. Andrea didn't talk so much about BMI, but it's a big thing that I use in my practice. Body mass index is sort of a height and weight formula. And a uh, normal weight is between 20 and 25 for a BMI. And so hers was 18, so she was underweight. Her initial lab evaluation came back uh, normal. I checked an MRI just to make sure her brain can get the message out. That was negative as well. So what she had, something, it's a big mouthful. It's functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, but it's basically that energy deficient state that I was talking about. 
the stress level was high because it's stressful for your body to have more calories going out than coming in. So that's the cortisol, fight or flight hormone. So your body says, okay, I'm fighting and I'm fleeing. Is it a good time to reproduce? No. The brain turns off that message to the ovary. The leptin level is very low, okay? So she had very low levels of ovarian hormones, very low levels of estrogen, okay? And it mimics what she was like in her prepubertal state. Why do we care, right? Your daughter doesn't necessarily want to have a period every month. The biggest issue is that adolescence, and I'm seeing this much more in my competitive athletes, the triad is that there's low energy availability because they're really watching what they're eating, okay? Um, causing irregular periods, and they're putting out a ton of calories because they're super active. It's very common with marathon runners, ballet dancers, and gymnastics. Gymnasts is who I see it in. Um, but this is a time that is very important to build bone. So the bone that is laid down for your entire life, right now, where we all are, was laid down in our late teens and early 20s, mostly in our late teens. So if your daughter stops getting periods at this critical time in her life, she is not only losing bone because we need estrogen to um, impact bone, but she's actually decreasing her peak bone mass. And that thinning of the bones, we cannot get it back. So that's why it's important that that be addressed. So the good news is that this is very treatable. Really what it is is you correct the energy uh, deficit. I try really hard not to put these patients on hormones initially. Dr. Epperson may disagree, but I send them to Dr. Epperson. I say, deal with the stress, and we try to really restrict their activity. But in periods of, you know, when I know that they've been without estrogen for a really, really long time, sometimes I will start to replace it just to try to preserve some of that bone mass. Um, but in general, this is very treatable. So if you can sit, and, and oftentimes if I sit and go through this entire pathway with a teenager, she'll say, oh, I didn't realize that I was doing this. And um, a little bit of activity restriction. The other thing that I kind of took out some of the slides, but um, the most important thing between the athlete who keeps getting her periods and the athlete who loses their periods is fat, okay? So a lot of these, Diets are calorie restricted, but the big thing is that there are some girls who eat zero fat, and I mean zero, and not all fat is bad, and the body needs a little bit of fat to maintain normal activity, and so um, if they add in a little fat, decrease a little activity, as little as a four pound gain in weight can actually resume normal periods, so um, without any medications at all, and the, of course the uh, the long-term benefits are the biggest in terms of bone. This takes a multifaceted approach. You need to talk to their coaches. You need to have them involved with a psychiatrist or psychologist if there's a lot of stress and anxiety as well. So in conclusion, puberty is a series of events. It ends in onset of menses and variation is normal. Talk with your daughter about what to expect. Seek medical help if you have any concerns about timing or tempo and uh, encourage your daughter to maintain a healthy weight and diet and do the same for yourself. Okay.